thank you very much and uh, I'm pleased to be able to see everyone today. Um, my name is Shane McKee, as Serena mentioned, I'm a consultant in clinical genetics at uh, the Northern Ireland Regional Genetics Centre based in Belfast. Um, I'm also the Chief Information Officer, uh, Chief Clinical Information Officer for Belfast Health and Social Care Trust. And that's going to flavour a little bit of the uh, perspective that I'm going to hopefully provide for you today in a very quick run through. We're a um, very small part of the UK and Northern Ireland here. We're one of the four devolved countries within uh, the UK. We have a population of only 1.9 million. So that makes us about uh, just under 3% of the UK population. And uh, so therefore I have to keep my talk to within about 3% of what Mark's talk was originally. And um, we were a fairly small contributor, I suppose, to the overall 100,000 genomes. We recruited in about 450 or thereabouts rare disease families in two cohorts <clears throat> and a very small number of cancer cases. And that small number, um, I think, largely reflects issues that, uh, that Mark has spoken about and, uh, and also in influenced our Welsh colleagues as well in terms of how we would proceed with cancer and whole genome sequencing. Um, but I think one of the big things that we were able to uh, get out of the, the 100,000, I'm not going to spend too long going over our, our stats or our figures, but uh, we were able to use the, um, the resource and the data that came from the 100,000 as we submitted our patients um, to establish multidisciplinary teams to really work that, that interpretation of the genomic data. And this turned out to be one of the most successful um, things that came out of the, of, the, of the 100K for us in Northern Ireland anyway. And um, this resulted in a diagnostic resolution. This is across our 450 patients of approximately 22% which seems a little bit low, but as Mark showed previously and as Zosha showed as well, um, that the, the, sp the specific cohorting of those patients was really quite variable. And in some of the cases, for example, in intellectual disability, the, the syndromes ones that uh, we as in clinical genetics would be used to seeing, um, we were able to get rates of diagnostic uh, yield. I think it was, I think we're currently sitting at about 40%, which is very comparable with the diagnostic yield that we got out of the Deciphering Developmental Disorders, the DDD study before. So I think this validates the approach. Um, I think I would also suggest that it validates the approach of, um, of, of clinical genetics as a clinical specialty and um, being deeply involved in this. Now, how do we, how do we take the, the relatively um, specialized world of clinical genetics and mainstream that out into the wider world into a more common disease and polygenic risk scores that's going to be a difficult question um, and then clinical genetics of course itself um, within Northern Ireland we find was extremely important in then interpreting the results that came back so a large proportion of our recruits were coming from other specialties right across Northern Ireland multiple different specialties in all five health and social care trusts that we have here um, so communicating those results back out to the, uh, the clinicians and then to the patients as well was a big challenge and it's where we needed that, uh, that clinical genetics approach. A little animation that I've got down on the bottom right there is a, a fusion of two of the most interesting, um, well, artificial intelligence, machine learning, call it what you will, um, developments that I think are going to bring quite a lot to um, our, our moving forward. And we're working quite closely with, um, with partners in this, in this kind of field. And the animation is uh, done by a company called MyHeritage, who some of you will be familiar with in looking at ancestry genomics. Um, and the composite face is a face of a child with a specific genetic syndrome that has been mapped from multiple different uh, children with the same syndrome at similar ages by a machine learning algorithm back to form this composite face and the animation. Um, it was a thing that I was trying to see, could we could we put these two together to um, to help with rare diseases and rare disease diagnostics? Because what matters to me as a geneticist and the way I make most of my diagnoses in clinic, so the patients who don't go to genome sequencing are because I either diagnose them in clinic or we have another diagnostic route that they go down. But we're looking at facial features, we're looking at clinical features. And the, the bottom line is that the, the key to the diagnosis, um, we have got pretty good gene agnostic techniques, but the key to the diagnosis is phenotype. And as Mark mentioned earlier on, um, getting the phenotypic information out of the EHRs and into uh, um, a format that we can use then to query the genome intelligently is the big challenge that, uh, that we're facing and certainly the biggest challenge that we are, we are having in Northern Ireland. So where we want to go <clears throat> from as a clinical geneticist and what I think we've been able to do through the 100,000 genomes 
is to develop this robust infrastructure that allows us to move from clinical presentation through to gen genomic diagnosis as quickly and as efficiently <clears throat> as we possibly can. So we're hoping, hoping to follow the UK developments, uh, particularly led by NHS England for uh, whole exome sequencing, and whole genome sequencing, following the, the indications, clinical indications that are being mapped out by the uh, UK test directory, with which you're all familiar. And then make sure that patients themselves across a very wide range of clinical contexts, clinical presentations, clinical specialties, right across Northern Ireland on an equitable basis are able to access that. So the idea then is that we take this diagnostic odyssey from being a long trek across the desert to being something at least relatively short, get us to the diagnosis, and then we can start asking those questions later on. And as Mark was talking about, the, the actionability that uh, comes out the other end of that. So that's what we're very much engaged in in Northern Ireland, particularly if we can develop uh, the therapies and the management strategies to, uh, to put that in place. Now, none of this happens in a vacuum, and this is the, um, the slide that I presented to our chief scientific advisor back a number of years ago, and um, I, he, he then stopped taking my calls as a result of this, largely because um, the thing that ties all this together, whether it's from the patient uh, support groups and the patients themselves, the government and the commissioning and the health and social care trusts, the uh, clinical world, which I exist in, industry, which a lot of my colleagues exist in, the research community and universities, our laboratories, etc. And the thing that binds that all together, the one ring to rule them all is the informatics. And that's got to flow. And that's been the, the key, um, I think both the barrier and the enabler of the recruitment within, uh, within Northern Ireland to the 100K. Um, and one of the big things that we're trying to map out at the moment is a model for an open platform data architecture that allows that data to flow in a federated and um, governance secure way across our ecosystem to bring these diagnoses and these research insights and these um, public health benefits out the other end. We're engaged in a very large process at the moment. Northern Ireland is going to become one of the, well, it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a pioneer country in a lot of ways to have a country scale, single mandated electronic health record. And that's going to be the EPIC system and the project for that's called Encompass and I've been involved in that project for quite a number of years now and it scares me a little bit and um, but one of the things that we're very clear on is that the data access has to be open and we have to use open standards to do that and we're trailblazing that to an extent using a project that I've called Genoceanic for the geno genomics open core engine accelerating Northern Ireland care which is a pretty bad uh, acronym, but it refers back to the maritime history and the great ocean going liners that used to be built in Belfast, the ones that didn't sink and the ones that did sink. Um, Titanic and Oceanic were among the, uh, the big ones. And we are using this to try and pull together our phenotypic data from source systems and also from direct clinician input and potentially then from wearables and from patient input and PROMs, uh, devices, and a data that's acquired even um, as, as on a social civic level that would normally be used by the councils, travel data, air quality data, and things like that, prescribing data. <clears throat> I'm trying to pull that together into um, a, a form that we can then start running some analytics on. And we're using a, a format called Open EHR or Open Air, which uh, some of our European colleagues and UK colleagues will be familiar with, um, very much a part of the Nordic um, health system at the moment, the open air uh, standards, um, also in other areas of, of Europe, particularly Slovenia, and uh, we're getting that implemented at the moment. And all my patients that were in the 100,000 genomes now have now got them into an open air uh, clinical data repository, and we're looking to connect that up then to our eventual Encompass EPIC system when the time comes. Uh, the reason that we did this was to get the platform to gather that phenotypic data that we then use using a, Mark spoke a bit about Eximizer earlier on to help us to tier the, or to rank the um, likely variants that were coming out of genomic sequencing, um, but also then to reuse that in, in different ways. So I'm talking about genomics now, but I'm not going to always want to be talking about genomics. I'm going to want to be talking about nephrology. I'm going to be wanting to talk about ophthalmology, pediatrics, hepatology, and cancer as well lots of different things in a very agile fashion so that we can then use this as a base for our um, diagnostic clinical community and our IT community and research and industry to get involved and start getting things, getting things moving and using this rich phenotypic data that we have 
to um, to deliver clinical benefit for our patients and improve outcomes. We've got partners with Cambio UK who are our lead uh, implementer of this, and uh, they're, work they're working with Future Perfect, who are another UK company, and also Better Healthcare, our friends in Slovenia, who have provided the clinical data repository uh, based on open air that the whole thing sits on. So it's it's an exciting project, and it's somewhere that I'm, I'm really quite uh, quite pleased to be, and I think we're, we're going to go places with it. And what's actually come out of that as well, and uh, Clive mentioned the, um, the COVID uh, sequencing that has been going on, and Marcus mentioned this also, but it, it was a thing that was not lost on us either, that if you're linking patients' clinical details up to genomic data, well, you can also link it up to viral genomic data as well. So we're putting together a proposal for our Department of Health um, that we're currently calling Pathoceanic, which is to effectively use the exact same infrastructure, the exact same clinical data repository that we're using for our genomic data or for our, well, for our phenotypic data and uh, genomic tags to uh, support the um, uh, gathering of data for the, uh, for the over the pandemic and also to link that then to viral data uh, and to our vaccination records. Also, so we have a vaccine management system that's currently sitting on its own. We've got our viral genome system that's sitting on its own with our phenotypic data that's scattered through the EHRs. So what we want to try and do is pull that all together so that we can, and it's fair to say as well, some of those patients, we haven't done this methodically, so we haven't tied this into the genomic consortium that Mark was talking about, although we have had um, explorations with them. But what we want to try and do is make sure that if any of our patients who have been through the rare diseases, or the cancer part of our 100,000 Genomes project, if they happen to have genomes in and they happen to be coming into this uh, pathogen sequencing system by another route, we've also, we're also able to cross-link those phenotypic data points with their genotypic data points, both at the, uh, the germline genome level and the viral genome level. So we think that's quite exciting. And it's also going to allow us to do things like develop apps that are ready for immediate rollout or very quick rollout of this platform, such as for infection prevention and control, cohorting patients, um, real-time data and dashboards that uh, can be used by our public health people. We have a data lake that all this goes into and uh, putting things into a data lake or data swamp is a bit of a scary thing for me. I know our Welsh colleagues and I'm very friendly with a few of the, uh, the guys in Wales who are doing this and in Scotland also who are working really hard to get open air to be the, the pathway out of the data swamp towards a more, a, a more unified data system. So the, the UK open air um, environment is really starting to take off and get really quite interesting. So longer term, um, the, the real objective here is to get the genomics more integrated into our mainstream of healthcare. As a geneticist, that's what I want to be doing. As a clinical informaticist, I also want that and I want my data to flow through all the other areas. We have this concept in Northern Ireland and our entire health development until at least 2026 is predicated on what we're calling the quadruple aim, which you'll all be familiar with from the um, Institute for Healthcare Improvement. That's uh, making life better for patients, making life better for our population in general, making life better for staff and doing that in a sustainable fashion. So the health economics is a, is a really important part of all this and making sure that it is sustainable and delivers on what we want. So we're currently working on what that Northern Ireland longer term plan is going to look like. And uh, there are a few changes that we need to make and uh, fiddling around with our governance structures to make sure that we're fit to, de to deliver it. But uh, collaborating with our colleagues across the UK and across Europe and across the world has really been, um, been very, very beneficial uh, to us for this. Sasha had mentioned about some of the patients where um, we've been getting results coming back from the research community that have been running through the GSIPs that Mark was talking about. And uh, we've had that also. Uh, we've also had some results that have come back through the 100K and the DDD project at the same time. So this model appears to be very applicable across the different uh, nations within the UK. But what I really want to do is I want to make this future proof. So Mark was talking as well about uh, we don't want this to sort of run to the end of the project and then fall off a cliff and no more get heard about it. We need this to be integrated into the mainstream. Uh, regular clinicians who would not normally be part of the genomic world need to be part of this world and they need to be requesting the, uh, the tests through. And that's another reason why we're building Genoceanic is to provide a, a platform effectively that allows them to actually order genomic tests and for that then to go through the, the process that I mentioned. So I guess the, the bottom line is genomics itself within Northern Ireland, <clears throat> we're using that as a catalyst to free up the data and to try and pull together all these different disparate 
information sources into something that's coherent and that actually then ends up delivering clinical benefit at the other side, including those, um, those diagnoses that are going to help to make for better outcomes. So thank you very much.